Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 38 to 45. Sign of Jonah. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with with this evil generation. What, What happens to an individual or a culture that willfully rejects the Lord Jesus? That's the issue we're considering this afternoon. For the individual or culture that knowingly and deliberately rejects the truth of Jesus, well, what happens? Well, Jesus teaches on this. He tells us one sign is given, one verdict awaits, and one experience is guaranteed. Since early May, we've been considering the advance of Jesus' kingdom. That's what Matthew chapter 11 through 13 is all about. And there's no question at all that since these words were spoken by Jesus, his rule has moved forward across the globe. It advanced in Jesus' day. It advanced in the time of the early church. It advanced through the first century. It advanced even here to this nation. It's one of the great wonders of the last 2,000 years that as human kingdoms come and human kingdoms go and human empires rise and human empires fall and presidents get elected and presidents get deposed and prime ministers, I suppose, as well, even in the midst of it all, the kingdom of Jesus advances. 64 AD, the emperor Nero recognized there were enough Christians in Rome to blame the fire of Rome on the Christians. They must have been quite a group. By the late first century, the regional governor in northwestern Turkey, Pliny, wrote to the emperor of the day Trajan, asking what to do with all these Christians. By the second century, there was a church here in London. By 350 AD, the Roman Empire was converted. And today, across the globe, the kingdom of Jesus Christ continues to advance apace. This unstoppable advance, however, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 11 through 13, will not go unopposed, unresisted. Oh, he says it will advance vigorously. It will be vigorously opposed. Think of that when you're sitting on the beach this summer. Watch the waves. There's no doubt the tide is coming in, if that's what it is doing. But it appears to advance in some places, and the next wave doesn't go quite so far. Is it retreating? but it is advancing. So what happens to the personal culture in the face of this inexorable advance resists the incoming tide and rejects Jesus? Well, Matthew is our teacher. We're in his seminary. This module of his core syllabus has to do with the advance of Jesus' kingdom. And he wants us to know what the advance of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus looks and feels like. It will advance. It will be resisted. For us as individuals, this is immensely important. We may be somebody here who actually resists the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Well, Jesus has tell us what what will happen. 
all of us will have friends and relatives, people sitting next to us at the desk, who resist the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Well, Jesus tells us what will happen. And for us as a church, what are we to make of a culture that resists the advance of Jesus' kingdom? Well, says Jesus, one sign, one verdict, one experience. I don't know what you thought as verse 38 and 39 were read for us. At first glance, Jesus' statement appears entirely unreasonable. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered Jesus saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is Jesus suggesting here? Is to ask for evidence evil? Is it that to engage my brain and seek confirmation is morally wrong? No. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and to the scribes. This is the group that have decided in the face of all evidence to the contrary and despite the lack of logic in their argument to suggest that Jesus is in fact on the side of the devil. We looked at this last week and the week before and their argument defies all logic for the incalculable good that Jesus is doing cannot possibly be being done in the name of the evil one. It would be a spectacular own goal. Do you remember the logic of that? Not only so, but the children of those who suggest such thing will denounce them ultimately because they are calling something which is self-evidently good, bad, and generations to come will look back on them, rather like those who rejected Wilberforce, who sought to overthrow slavery in the name of Christianity, and find them utterly contemptible. But now having heard his logic and unable to refute it, along come the Pharisees and the scribe, verse 38, and ask for another sign. Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And so says Jesus, well, you can't deny the evidence I provided. You can't refute the logic I've applied. Rather than recognize that I am who I say I am, you simply ask for another sign. I've just given you another sign back in verse 22, the casting out of the demon. So when Jesus says an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, he's not undermining the need for evidence. There is a condemnation here of a request for signs on demand or signs as a sop for unbelief or signs in order to aid procrastination and delay in decision-making about Jesus. And to the person who says, Having seen the evidence, I need another sign. One sign, one verdict, one experience. Now, I guess all of us are familiar with the person in the pub who you answer the question, they ask another question. You answer that question, they ask another question. You answer that question, they ask another question. It gradually becomes apparent that this is just putting off. Uh, it's a smokescreen. They don't want to take Jesus seriously at all. One sign. The sign in verse 39 to 40 is the sign of Jonah. And this is the sign of a man who has risen from what you might call a watery grave and emerges heralding the certain coming of future judgment. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I don't know how much we know about the prophet Jonah. Jonah was sent from a people who refused to turn back to God. And he was sent to a people who urgently needed to turn back to God. He himself was a disobedient prophet who sought to run away from God. And Jonah's rebellion was arrested by God through a violent storm at sea. Jonah was rescued from certain death by a great fish. So Jonah emerged from the belly of the fish as a living, walking, talking embodiment of the folly of rejecting God, of the certainty of future judgment. 
of the possibility of one last chance of rescue. There's the sign. You can run, but you can't hide Jonah. And when Jonah came to the city of Nineveh, which is where he'd originally been sent and rather objected to going, Jonah spoke with all the authority of somebody who had been rescued by God and as somebody who couldn't hide from God in the depths of the deep blue sea, who couldn't hide from God in the belly of the great fish, knowing that judgment is certain, God sees where you are, wherever you are, but as you turn back to God, there is hope for mercy. Notice the just as in verse 40. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In Jewish record of timekeeping, one part of any 24-hour period accounts for the whole 24-hour period. So Jesus is not against providing evidence for us. He's given us the evidence of the works that we read about in the gospel, what are called the works of the Christ. They're all here. But to the contrary, who refuse to take seriously the evidence provided, to those who go further and start to call good evil, light, dark, the work of Christ, the work of Satan, there's just one sign left. I'll give you a sign, says Jesus, the sign of King Jesus emerging from the grave, the sign of the resurrection man preaching the coming judgment of God and the possibility of one last chance of forgiveness, the sign of Jesus risen from the dead on that first Sunday morning, the living embodiment of a living God. This is the sign of Jesus with this last greatest work of the Christ, demonstrating that he is the Christ, the one appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead, the resurrection of Jesus. So here is the sign of Jonah, the resurrection man preaching repentance. And here is the one sign that is given to a people who repeatedly reject the truth of Jesus. And if you trace through the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find this is precisely how the Apostles preached when they preached the gospel. God has appointed a day when he will judge the world by one man, and he's given evidence of that by raising Jesus from the dead. Here is the sign, the resurrection. Look at it. The evidence is there. It's a fact on the table of history. You cannot rub it out. Peter saw the risen Jesus. The 12 saw the risen Jesus. The 12 saw the res risen Jesus again. Over 500 people at one point saw the risen Jesus, physically raised from the grave. It was the Jesus who had been crucified. And here is the evidence that there is life beyond for every one of us and that we will face the resurrection, the, the risen Lord Jesus in judgment at the end of our days. Now, we like to think that if we reject Jesus, we will die and enter oblivion. I mean, that is quite a faith system with very little evidence. And Jesus tells us that at our death, we will await judgment and we will meet God as our judge. And he urges us to turn back for forgiveness before it is too late. Now this explains why Jesus where, goes where he goes in verses 41 and 42. There is one sign given, there is one verdict as is certain. Jesus says the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We could have a whole Tuesday on this, couldn't we? That Jesus insists there is a judgment. 
that we will be raised together with all who have gone before us and any who come after us will be raised. That we will meet him in judgment and that Jesus is greater than Solomon and greater than Jonah. Two extraordinary groups here. The people of Nineveh, who were possibly the most wicked and dissolute city of their day. Nineveh was not only the vice capital of its time, it was also the warmongering bully boy thug of the Assyrian Empire. If you want to know about Nineveh, come to church next Sunday morning, not this coming Sunday, but the one afterwards, and there'll be a sermon preached over at St. Peter's Cornhill on Nineveh. The prophet Nahum speaks all about Nineveh, that bloody city full of lies and plunder, countless whorings of her prostitutes. Nineveh was brutal. Nineveh was corrupt. Nineveh was land-grabbing. Nineveh was dissolute. Yet when Nineveh heard the preaching of Jonah, they turned to a man and woman back to the living God. So here is this extraordinary moment in history being described. The word reached the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That was the king. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, to be published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The whole city turned. All they had was Jonah and his rather unusual brand of aftershave, smelling slightly of the internal whale. They hadn't actually witnessed Jonah swallowed and regurgitated. All they had was the preaching. They didn't have the Old Testament scriptures like we have. They didn't have Jesus like we do. They didn't have the resurrection as we have. They had the preaching of Jonah. They recognized God's right to judge. They recognized God's hand in judging and rescuing Jonah. They acknowledged their own guilt. And led by the king of the day, they dressed themselves in sackcloth and ashes, declared a fast and turned back to God. All 120,000 of them who, as the prophet Jonah puts it, did not know their left hand from their right with regards to matters of spirituality. Picture them on the judgment day as they rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. They repented. Then there's the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba. It's uh, either in modern-day Ethiopia or in the Yemen. Now, the Queen of the South was quite a woman. You can read about her in 1 Kings 10. When she came to visit Solomon, she visited with a vast retinue of camels and courtiers and precious stones and gold. Her gift to Solomon, thank you for having me present, was 120 talents of gold. That is 8,000 pounds in weight of gold. And today's spot price, I'm told, this morning, it's around about 16 million pounds. To put that into perspective, when the Japanese emperor last week visited King Charles, he brought a Wajima lacquerware box, and the most expensive I could find online this morning was 3,000 pounds. Just saying. Yet for all her business and running this empire, what it must have been for her down there south of uh, Saudi Arabia, for all her business and urgent concerns, running her kingdom, her calendar, the demands of her time, her schedule, she cancelled them all, she cleared the diary, she packed the court belongings, she travelled and made her way 1,500 miles to hear Solomon speak. And she only had the teaching of Solomon. She didn't have Jesus. She didn't have the Sermon on the Mount. 
the Bible, the instruction in the epistles. So it is worth, isn't it, pausing at this point and considering the city and the pathetic excuses for not coming to hear the word of God. You can imagine the people of Nineveh rising up at judgment. You had the gospel. It was available in printed form for a pound a go. You had Christianity explored. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, lunchtime. You had the internet. You had more Christian books published than has ever been published in the history of the world. You had podcasts. You had modern commentators speaking about how good Christian values have been for the Western world. And you never came to listen. You had a Christian godmother, a Christian grandmother, a Christian great uncle, a Christian friend in the office, and you never repented. The men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The culpability of a city such as ours, with what? A working population of 350,000, with so much riches in terms of the word of God and the truth of God and the resurrection of Jesus, as we just find excuses after excuses, after excuses. One sign, one verdict, one experience. Jesus now prophesies, and I hope as you go away and think about this, you will see this prophecy has come true. He prophesies what will happen to such a culture or individual as they willfully reject the truth of Jesus. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to the house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. They enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So it will be for this evil generation. I think the key word there is empty. And the point, I think, is simple. To the generation in which Jesus was working who did not respond positively to him, asking him into their lives, surrendering to him, having experienced his work and his word and rejected it, things will not stand still. The house is swept clean. The house has been put in order. Everything seems to be fine in the house, but for one reason or another, they haven't actually responded to the truth of Jesus. The house remains empty. And so the demon goes out and finds seven other, and the worst state of the man is worse than it was at the beginning. The owner may well be complacent. All is well. And leaving the house, they move on to other business. The owner may well be naive, just unaware of danger. I think that's our culture. The humanist doesn't realize that his or her humanism has come out of Christianity in the first place and thinks, oh, well, we're all fairly decent, aren't we? And so we're just naive like Little Red Riding Hood. The owner may simply be too busy or too preoccupied or too exhausted to take any action. But at the end of the day, if he or she has not made a move in the direction of Jesus, the final condition of that person will be worse than it was at the first. If we don't respond to him, having experienced his word and his work, things do not stand still. So naive, isn't it, to think that they do, like Chamberlain on the runway in 1939. Things are not neutral, says Jesus. Whoever is not with me is against me, says Jesus. There are just two sides, says Jesus. There is no Switzerland, no no man's land, says Jesus. Whoever does not gather with me scatters, says Jesus. And if we will not side with Jesus, we find ourselves open to the most powerful evil forces and defenseless. Now, I think all of us here are very familiar with this kind of picture, aren't we? You know, the business that does not take 
care to guard against the opposition will be overrun. And the politician that does not pay attention to the opposition and argue for the right and good will be overrun. And the war, that, sorry, the nation that does not guard its borders will be overrun. And the person who does not side with Jesus will be overrun. And for our generation that makes a virtue out of standing aloof to the commands and teaching of Jesus, when we had so much, this is the most stark warning. The parent who says, well, I just wanted my child to make up his own mind, so I I left them to take on board whatever they happen to hear, whoever happened to be teaching them. The school that says, oh, well, we'll we'll teach everything is exactly the same, all morally neutral. The city worker who says of their life or of their family, oh, I think I'll leave this teaching of Jesus to another time. It's very salutary, isn't it? How culpable, how naive, how in danger. Well, it's a very bleak message from Jesus, isn't it? But that's because he's speaking to people who are willfully and deliberately rejecting Jesus. I think you will agree with me that the prophecy of verses 43 to 45 has come true, that the culture that says, oh, we've done with this Jesus in 1963, finds itself completely overrun by evil forces. And it works through into our families, into the whole of our society. And wonderfully, this passage holds out the prospect that Jonah preached of, the mercy of God. And we'll hear about that next week. Let's pray together. We pray, Father, that you would press in the reality of coming judgment to our hearts and consciences, to our lives, that we would be deeply aware of it. We pray, Father, for this city, not knowing left from right, that in your kindness you would have mercy on our colleagues and friends who surround us. We pray for this nation, and we ask our Father in heaven that you might grant to us the opportunity of repentance through the proclamation of your gospel far and wide. For your name's sake, amen.